Hey, it's Barry Moltz, still getting your small business unstuck. And a lot of small business owners aren't doing anything. They think that if they can just hold on long enough, they can go back to whatever was normal. I have to tell you, now is the time to burn your boats because we're never going back to normal. And I really believe the small business owners that take an opportunity to pivot right now are gonna be the ones that are gonna be the winners in the long run. Joining me today is Scott Case. He's the CEO of Upside Business Travel. Scott, thanks so much for being with me. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it, Barry. So you're in an industry that was hit particularly hard, which is the travel industry, which is down by 96%. How did this, how'd this work for you? Well, the first thing is, I think we're actually very fortunate in some respects that our business got whacked right away. We knew very quickly that travel was gonna dissipate and we we're gonna need to do very different things. First, we've basically, like most, stabilize our, our business and figure out, okay, how do we bridge to the future? What's our strategy there? And I'll come back to that in a second. So get whacked, find a bridge, and then start planning for the future. So on the bridge front, we sort of say, well, we have a lot of talented people, particularly in our sales and marketing organization. How might we go to other companies who may be on the winning side of this curve and start to help them scale and grow in that? And we actually landed... I think we ultimately ended up with three key clients that we could take our sales and marketing organization that was going after small businesses to help them with their business travel problem and apply them to other classes of problems. So that was the first thing we did on the bridge strategy. And then the future strategy is figuring out how do you understand what are the likely possibilities in the future? And how do you prepare your business to be able to take advantage of those? And what signals do you start to track, in our case, travel, to start to see things bubbling back up again? So before we get to that, I love what you said was, for those companies that were on the winning side of this curve, I always feel that one of, the, one of these comes around, this is my, I think it's my fifth recession now. I thought the last one was my last recession. It's almost like musical chairs. When the music stops, you're not quite sure which side of the curve you're gonna be on. And it's not really your fault, but you have to deal with it nonetheless, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the, the trick with this one is that it is so pervasive and it is disrupting really every business in some form. Some disrupted in positive ways and some are being disrupted in massively negative ways. I think the trick for founders or owners of small businesses is to step back and go to do a couple of things. One is look at your core values. Why did you get in this business in the first place? Who were your customers? Who were you trying to serve? Are those things still true or will they be true in the future? If they're not, you really have to make a hard pivot. If they are, now you have to say, okay, well, how do those values and those problems apply in the new part of the new reality? And for those that are winning in this reality, there's a trap. And the trap is that right now is pandemic time. The things that are working now may not work again. So you may be in, in trouble in the future if you don't make sure you build a bridge, not just to take advantage of what's going on now, but do you really have a sustainable business if the patterns that we see today of being trapped at home don't happen anymore, where they move to a new state? So you're winning now. The question is, how do you make sure that you're going to win for the long haul? So what you did, my understanding is that you actually you had a great team of talent and you rented out your team to these people that were on the winning side of the curve. How is that working for you? It's been fantastic. I think part of it, when you're opportunistic and you view the world like we do, which is to um, really evaluate everything and see which things could turn into positives for you. We've met companies that we otherwise wouldn't have met. We've engaged with other founders in ways that might not have been open to us. And we've discovered new distribution partnerships and channels for our business in the future. We sell business travel solutions to small businesses. We've started to engage with other companies who provide other types of services to small businesses. When travel comes back, we're much more likely to have broader distribution partnerships than we would. Now that's not why we did it, but that's what has played out for us. And so being a little opportunistic, taking our assets and deploying them and building a bridge strategy is gonna pay dividends down the line. And that's really the key. Every business has to look at and say, what are the assets they can deploy? whether it's skills or partnerships or data, whatever it is, because it may not be obvious really what your secret sauce is. Yeah, in fact, one of the first things we did the first week we went into fully remote, which I think was the, the March 13th was the Friday that was our last, our first day in remote land. I think that feels like two years ago, right? I know, it does, it does. Here's the thing. 
the, that first week, what we did was we did, we wrote two things down. One was what our predictions for the next 24 months were going to be in travel. And we decided, number one, we didn't believe there was going to be any business travel for the next six months. And number two, we believe 12 to 18 months of recession. And we've been working within that frame and making decisions there. The second thing that we did was we wrote a long form document of who we are, what our assets were in a narrative form that we could read and believe in about who we were and what we could accomplish. We then used that as basically our early selling tool and said, hey, we've got these assets and these capabilities. You have a, an opportunity to scale. Maybe we can help each other. And so that asset list kind of became a view for us to say, what's possible? And we actually took it apart. So we first rented our sales team out and then we said, shit, we've got great designers and great marketers. So then we put together a package for, hey, we can help you market a new business or run experiments for you. So we ended up deconstructing that asset base and literally creating simple one sheets we had our design team design them and we could go to other partners and we've now spun up a bunch of relationships and opportunities that we otherwise would not have had. Yeah, that's really fabulous. So you've alluded to a little bit of what you think the future of business travel is. No business travel for the next six months. Where do we go from there? What does it look like? Well, you're already starting to see some of the supplier side start to change, right? Airlines are figuring out how to block off middle seats. They're scrubbing things. People have to wear masks. We're going to see an evolution of those changes around safety and security. So first up, it's gonna come from the suppliers, mainly airlines and hotels. Rental cars are gonna to have to change the way they clean things. Hotels are gonna to have to put safety ratings up. We're gonna see a lot there. From a traveler standpoint, we believe that safety is gonna be a paramount thing, both at the time that you make the choices about where you're gonna go, how you behave on a plane, whether you're wearing a mask or whether you bring the tools that you need. And then the supply side on the, particularly airlines, the, the distribution has been disrupted around where planes need to be. The way that the government has structured the airline deal they put together, airlines are gonna be flying empty planes to places where nobody wants to go and they're gonna be flying, flying incredibly full planes to the places everybody wants to go. So that Chicago to LA flight is gonna be oversold and be super expensive, but that Chicago Peoria flight is gonna be empty. So we're gonna see these strange disruptions Hotels in big cities are likely to have real problems, but smaller cities and the outskirts, people might stay outside the city even though they have meetings inside the city because they don't wanna be in the densely populated areas. So the human behavior is going to be fascinating to watch as we unlock this. And the fact that we're opening state by state, you're in Illinois, I'm in Maryland. Uh, you know, Genevieve who's on the call with us is in Washington DC. Each one has different rules. We've got a whole team in New York. We got people in LA, we got people in San Francisco. They're all going to be disrupted. So how all this plays out, especially in this kind of pandemic period, is going to be really, really tough to manage. However, I believe that people need to be face to face to get business done when they're doing big deals, when they're making big sales, when they're creating partnerships. This as good as it is for us to interact. It's not the same. We're hardwired to want to be social and together. So I believe that travel is going to come back, but it's going to be lumpy and weird. It's interesting to me because, you know, you got to convince or at least relay to the public that it's safe to fly. And then you see a picture like what happened on United Airlines comes out and it just wrecks everything. I keep thinking, Scott, what were those people thinking, putting all those people on the airplane? Yeah, look, I think that we're, we're learning. I think that the challenge is just like we had after 9-11 and the subsequent terrorist events that changed the way that we take off our shoes or go through security or what happens with a locked cabin door. Um, I think that we're going to have to learn over time and to figure out what the right balance is for those things. Everybody wants to keep people safe. There's no doubt that United Airlines wants to do the right thing. They want their employees to be safe, as does everyone. However, we don't really even know what that means just yet. And so we're going to be feeling our way there, which is part of the challenge of this disease. And if you look at Anthony Fauci on one end and maybe Donald Trump on the other, you've got this wide span of what's possible and we don't have the risk models to define which ones of those are the right ones. And who knows where it's gonna lie. And we're just learning so much every day about this. So the good news is, is that we've got a lot of humanity's smartest people working every day to figure out how this thing behaves and how we can start to be smart about how we travel again. It's interesting, Scott, because I'm already seeing my behavior change. I used to travel, I'm going to my first trip in Phoenix. Whenever I go there, I used to take Ubers. Now I'm thinking, nope, I want to be able to control my own destiny, keep safe. So I said, I'm going to rent a car this time. And I haven't rented a car in Phoenix for years. And I usually rent from dollar, it's 75 bucks for two days. 
But then I heard that Hertz has this 15 point plan where they're gonna seal the car so you know you're the next one to get into it. Plus they've created this technology with clear the airport security people where all I have to do to pick up my car is to scan my face and I'm in. So now I'm gonna pay twice as much just so I can feel safe than I usually would. So I'm renting with Hertz now instead of I usually would dollar. So I'm already seeing a change. Yeah, look, you're absolutely gonna see that change. And even more importantly, when you think about we were all dependent upon ride sharing, how does that behavior change? Do I wanna get in a car that just got, somebody just got out of it at the airport? You know, I'm more likely to rent the car as a result of that. My behavior about these things are changing, even things as simple as scooters, right? That whole business model is going to be radically changed as people's behavior change. And just to take back even a little bit further outside of travel, you know, you live in a city right now. How many people are going to decide they don't want to live in the city anymore? They're going to move to the suburbs and you're going to see real estate prices start to change where they shift to the outskirts. These are unknowns that we're going to have to walk through and each step and part of what we need to do as upside business travel is to layer in a lot of data so you can see what all these patterns are and that'll be true in real estate that'll be true in travel that'll be true in insurance that'll be true in banking there'll be all kinds of industries that are going to be disrupted by this they haven't even contemplated it yet it's interesting because i'm building a house right now in scottsdale arizona on five acres and i'm looking forward to being there instead of an apartment building with 300 people so i'm doing exactly i'm doing exactly what you predicted i'm also finding that i'm very careful on who i take take out food from i want to know what condition the food comes in is the box sealed i mean papa john's had this great commercial scott where it says no one touches your food from the time that it leaves the oven till it arrives at your place we're going to pay attention to this stuff yeah i think that's going to be true even for things when you're a traveler like you, you know you used to look at hotels and say hey do you have your own you know do you have a kitchen do you have can you can you order a room service or not well a lot of hotels aren't doing that anymore well now you're going to be in that same boat who, who can I get food from? Which restaurants get it? How familiar am I? I haven't, I've been to Chicago a bunch of times, but I don't, I used to trust that, hey, this is America. This is probably all just fine. I don't know the same things you do. So part of this is going to be information flow. I think whole new opportunities like super Yelps are going to turn up where we're really specific about trusted sources that are verified so that if I know you stayed at that hotel or you recommended it, I'm much more likely to do that myself because I'm also a business traveler in that place. So new ways of getting information are going to emerge and new opportunities for, frankly, lots of entrepreneurs are going to pop up everywhere. And if you're a small business owner and you're looking at these things, you really need to think about how these things might play out and where those opportunities might emerge that you can position yourself to be in the way of. All right, and the last thing I want to ask you was, you're an experienced entrepreneur. You've had a lot of success. This is a very difficult time in the history of the American economy. What advice do you have for the small business owners to get them through what's going on right now? I think the number one thing is to make sure that you have a plan to get through the crisis phase, which has an unknown duration to it, but you've really got to have a strategy that says, hey, I got to live through this part. That's going to be about making sure that you understand where your cash position is, asking questions like, hey, if your revenue dropped by 50%, what would you need to do? Having those contingency plans in place and figuring it out. The next thing is figuring out what is the recovery going to look like. I've talked a lot about recession, but the recovery is where the real emergence of our economy is going to be. And that is going to be driven by who your customers are. So are those customers gonna have the economic resources to be able to be your customers? And this is the tricky part. Are, their custom, are your customers' customers gonna have that? If you sell B2B and you think, ah, oh, I'm safe, right? Well, if your B2B customer is a B2C customer and we have 25% unemployment, those customers aren't buying from them and therefore they're not gonna buy from you. And I'll tell you a story at Upside, we obviously had to you know, cut our costs quickly because we knew travel was gonna be there. So our income stream was gonna be gone. We found ourselves with 134 different software as a service platforms that we were using to run our business. Okay, it was probably $250,000 a month. We cut that dramatically, like by about, a, to, to about two thirds, by two thirds. So we had a third left. We went to every one of those SaaS companies and said, we can't pay you anymore. Either we're turning it off or you gotta cut the bill. Well, guess what? They thought they were safe. We were a B2B company, right? But they're not. And so it's an illusion. So what you've got to look at is who are your customers in the future and how will they be impacted by the recession? Those are the key things you've got to work out as a business owner today. Well, Scott, I appreciate you joining us. Where can people learn more about what you're doing at Upside? 
Uh, it's very simple. Just visit www.upside.com and you can learn about what we're doing. And uh, we'd love to see when travel comes back to have everybody as a customer. Thanks, Scott.